study. This is great. We're going to have a wonderful lecture with Dr. Lauren Shu, one of our polyclinic rheumatologists. But that's just in a few minutes. I'm going to give a quick intro first. And part of this is really a story of my recent extremely short vacation, aka three days, uh, up to Vancouver, BC. And it just it made me think about some things, as it really is kind of nice to get away from it all, isn't it? So when you lose sight of your goals, Regroup and look at things from a new perspective. Be inspired by the simple things around you. This is kind of you know, profound and simple all at the same time. Feel stuck in a maze. This is in the Van Dusen Botanical Gardens. This is an actual maze. And my daughter walking way too fast, and I was anxious because I was following her, and I didn't want to get lost. <laughs> so she's way ahead of me racing. And it was actually a good maze. The very center of the maze, when you reached it, was a monkey tree. You knew you'd arrived. And we actually met each other there. It was great. And it was easy getting out. It was just hard to find that monkey tree. <laughs> so if you're stuck in a maze, try a new path. Beautiful gardens. If you've ever been there, they're just stunning. I guess their sister place is the Bloedel Reserve. But uh, just beautiful. You can get yourself lost there for hours. Things don't seem quite right. <laughs> now, come on. When I saw this sign, I was like, what? I thought, oh, I think that's French Connection UK, but anyway, you can, you can decide what it really means. Learn to appreciate new ways. So, yeah, maybe flowers are spelled with a Z. Come on. So, you just have to kind of open your mind, get a new perspective. Are things vaguely familiar? Anyone know what this plant is? Gecko. Oh, very good. Learn something new about something old. Just kind of pause and reflect. That's not ginkgo on the bottom, but uh, it's really a beautiful tree. And when in doubt, this is my daughter's first helicopter ride. All three of us were in the helicopter. She was panicked, and then I think honestly she's a daredevil because she loved it. She was co-pilot. Learn to appreciate the little things. This is on the top of Grouse Mountain. This little creature said goodbye as we stepped in the helicopter, and I thought, please God, let this not be the last creature I ever see. <laughs> it's really cute. Go for quality, not quantity. And let me tell you, I have no connections to this restaurant, but Miku Restaurant in Vancouver is just stunning. I love sushi, but this was exquisite, exquisite. And uh, it was, you know, you have to slow down and savor each bite because it was just beautiful. Be your own cheerleader. Hey, that's actually a sign on a health club right on Vancouver waterfront. That was awfully cool. Have things your way, says fresh food, custom built, and they kind of build it to go. Just do it anyway. Now, I don't know these people, and most of them actually didn't really know how to dance, but who cares? They were out there. This is beneath Robson Street or Robson Square late at night. The lights are going, everyone's partying, and I got my daughter out there for all of two minutes before she was super embarrassed. And I don't think she was embarrassed about me, it just she didn't know how to dance. So it was just a blast. People out there, and it was packed. It was absolutely packed. Remember the bigger picture. So we're actually higher up in the helicopter. A little scary, but it was beautiful, beautiful um, BC mountains. And see the beauty all around. This was back at Van Dusen Gardens. And, uh, this is actually, I looked this up, maybe not the greatest slide to end on because it's a pitcher plant and I guess they're carnivorous, but at any rate, I thought it was beautiful. <laughs> so um, it's really something to kind of think about as you look at your health, especially if I think about your joints, you want to exercise more, you want to be more healthy, and I think we just have to kind of reflect on what our bodies are ready to do and what we're trying to tell them to do. So I'm going to have a switch over in the slides and Dr. Shu is going to come up and speak to us on arthritis. So, um, first of all, thank you for inviting me to come and talk with you. Um, as we're getting the slides set up, um, today I'm going to talk about arthritis, and especially like living, living well with arthritis. So it's about a 25-minute talk, so we should have plenty of time for questions afterwards. Although if there's something that you uh, need to ask during, just you know, we'll, we'll do that. Okay. Um, so we'll start. So. This is, this is kind of the outline of the talk I'm going to do. I'm going to just do a brief overview of arthritis, um, mostly talking about osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis, because there are so many types of arthritis that if we went through each one, it would take up the, the whole talk. So really the two most common ones. 
And then I'm going to talk about weight and its effect on joints. And then we'll go through uh, exercising with arthritis. And then finally, a little bit on diet and inflammation. Arthritis facts. So there's estimated 48 million people in the US who have arthritis or other rheumatic conditions. Many rheumatic conditions are chronic and unfortunately are unlikely to go away. While there may not be a cure, there are effective management options for most, and the goal is to reduce pain and improve function. So osteoarthritis. This is the most common type of arthritis. It affects 27 million in the US, the majority over the age of 65. Uh, joint pain is a symptom, and it's caused by loss of articular cartilage, which is the tough but flexible connective tissue that covers the bones of the joints. Most commonly affects hips, knees, and hands, and especially in women it affects hands. Uh, the world's population is aging and becoming more overweight, and those are two major risk factors for developing osteoarthritis. Other uh, risk factors include joint injuries, so those with, say, ACL injuries um, count, or any kind of fracture in one extremity, and as well as joint deformities, such as unequal leg links. And the thought is um, it, it affects gait mechanics, and so you wear the joints differently. So this is an x-ray of uh, the knee on the on your left, this is a normal knee x-ray, what you'll see is the joint space here. Now, on x-rays, only the bone shows up on x-rays, and any soft tissue and cartilage shows up as just the black space you see. But as you can tell, I think it's easier if I point, um, as you can tell, this is a nice joint space, and that's where the cartilage is living. Um, the joints are nice and smooth. So if you go to the slide on the right, you can see and I've, there's some arrows in there about how one side is actually that the joint space is narrower and that means there's loss of cartilage on that side. And then it's harder to see, but there are some bone spurs that are popping out on the side there. And that's also a sign of osteoarthritis. Now this is a cartoon on hand osteoarthritis. In similar idea where you'll see that uh, joint space narrowing, and sometimes there'll be some inflammation. And then what happens is you get a bony nodule that forms. In osteoarthritis, it tends to be more the distal joints, as well as what we call the proximal interphalangeal joint, which is more, I think, of the, the middle joint. And they'll, they'll feel hard and, and nodular. How that differs from, say, rheumatoid arthritis is rheumatoid arthritis tends to be more joint swelling, and it's going to be softer and squishier. Rheumatoid arthritis also tends to affect more the proximal joints as well as what we call uh, these MCP joints, the larger hand joints. So rheumatoid arthritis, it's the most common autoimmune arthritis. It affects about 1.5 million in the US. It affects women more than men in about a three to one ratio. It is an autoimmune disease in which the disease's own immune system attacks its own joints, and that causes joint inflammation and damage, which causes pain. It tends to affect more the small joints, with the hands and feet being the most involved, although we will see wrist and ankles as well. The cause of rheumatoid arthritis is unknown, um, there is a lot of research looking at uh, estrogens and female gender as, as far as why the ratio of, of women are, are so um, outnumber men, but nothing's come through yet. So this is an x-ray of rheumatoid arthritis. So once again, we're looking at, I'll show you something more normal. These joints here, a little bit more normal, you know, with the nice joint space there. And as you see some of these other joints, you can see how those joint spaces are uh, showing some damage. There's no joint space. And actually, this one right here, you can see what we call an erosion, which is like a bite-like lesion out of the joint. This kind of damage is what we're trying to avoid when we treat people with rheumatoid arthritis. So before we move on, any questions so far? Yes. Yeah, I was curious, you mentioned um, 
that for women it's common to have osteoarthritis right in the hands. Is there a reason for that or any idea? There's a lot of speculation. There's some thought that potentially hormones. And then there's other thoughts about um, inflammation, which I will talk about later as far as um, hand osteoarthritis versus, say, knee and hip osteoarthritis. But good question. Ask me again if I don't get to it. <laughs> so, so we'll move on to weight and arthritis. So we do know increased weight raises the risk of getting certain types of arthritis. Also, when one already has arthritis, that excess weight makes the arthritis worse. So in osteoarthritis, the more weight on the joint, the more stress, and the more likely it will be worn and damaged. Okay, so research studies have shown a positive relationship between weight and osteoarthritis. Results have been consistent in finding that overweight people are at increased risk of developing osteoarthritis when compared to those who are not. So according to the CDC, or the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, the prevalence of obesity among adults with arthritis is about 54% higher than those without. And so the term obesity we're going to use as you know, BMI greater than 30, which is the medical term. So this is an interesting map I found on the CDC website as, as I was looking for some information. So this is just a map of the US. It's, it's looking at the prevalence of self-reported obesity among US adults in the US. And so as we look at, I'm oh, sorry, as we look at, say, th this area, the, the orange states, I guess, this is where there's the higher rate of reported obesity. So more the Midwest and the South, right in here. So as we move on to the next slide, and these slides weren't connected, I just happened to find them separately, but I think they are interesting. So this is another uh, a map of the US. It's a study looking at the prevalence of obesity among US adults with arthritis. And so once again, if we look at, say, the darker green shade, in these states we're looking at, in, in people with arthritis, over 40% of them are classified as obese. And so what I find interesting is, it's, it's an interesting visual in looking at this map and where we're seeing the higher rates. And as you move back to this map, and so I think it's a good visualization of how obesity affects arthritis and how we know that obesity is a risk factor. Because essentially, as I was showing these slides uh, yesterday to my kids, and my seven-year-old daughter made this comment about, well, those slides look the same. And I said, well, that's, that's great. That's the point I'm trying to make here, OK? So weight and stress on joints. So we know that every pound of excess weight adds about four to five pounds of extra pressure on the knees. So essentially, you go to the grocery store and it's like one bag of sugar that you're carrying around on your knees with each step you take, okay? So, so if you've gained a few pounds, it ends up being exponentially, say, 10, 15, 20 pounds on each knee. The flip side is, if you lose some weight, you'll get a lot of benefit. So there's a strong relationship between weight loss and improvement in knee pain. For prevention, it's reported that for every 10 pounds that a weight that you lose, you can reduce your risk of knee osteoarthritis by up to 50%. Okay? In those with knee osteoarthritis, a recent study noted weight loss of 5% produced meaningful improvements in, in pain. And in those that lost over 10% of weight, knee osteoarthritis symptoms improved by up to 40%. And so you can do something about this. But weight, weight and stress isn't the only story. So it's thought that, that um, fat itself is an active tissue that creates and releases chemicals. And many of these chemicals promote inflammation. So the amount of fat tissue increases during weight gain and those major chemicals produce more chronic inflammation. So examples of some of these chemicals include uh, adipocytokines, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and interleukin-1. And so those of you who have rheumatoid arthritis or are familiar with rheumatoid arthritis might recognize that tumor necrosis factor alpha and interleukin-1 
are both chemicals where there are biologic therapies directed at those for treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. So you may have heard of, say, Enbrel or Humira and Remicade, and those are anti-tumor necrosis factor alpha uh, agents to um, treat rheumatoid arthritis and its inflammation. So we're, we are seeing a connection there. So this was an interesting article. It came out in Time Magazine in May of 2012. And the title is, Is Obesity Causing a Rise in Rheumatoid Arthritis Among Women? And this was a study that came out of Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. And basically when they factor in everything else, the only explanation would, was that the rise in obesity was causing this increase in rheumatoid arthritis that we're seeing. And so we know the, the, the inflammatory chemicals from fat, which affect osteoarthritis, also play a role in rheumatoid arthritis. And studies have shown a rise in the incidence of RA with the increasing prevalence of obesity thought to be the reason. So in summary, you know, excess weight causes both joint stress, but it also causes production of inflammation promoting chemicals, which makes weight control really important in those who already have arthritis, as well as for prevention of arthritis, okay? So the take home here is, and I'm sure you've mentioned it many times, is, is weight is a modifi modifiable risk factor that we can do something about, okay? So before we move on to exercise and arthritis, any questions or comments? Yeah. Does arthritis, is it progressive in and of itself? I guess the simple answer would be yes. yes. I mean, I think as we look at uh, osteoarthritis mostly, and we talk about stress and joint damage, you know, the longer you live, the more likely, the more likely you will develop that. Yeah. I liked your um, slide and your data about the fact that you don't need to lose a ton of weight to have profound impacts on the arthritis in your knees. That was really, I think some people get dismayed, like, oh, I have to lose the 80 pounds I've been trying to lose for the last 30 years, but you know, actually losing 10 pounds goes such a long way to reducing that. That was really nice yeah, to see Absolutely, that. I think small, I mean, I think, like everything else, small increments, small improvements, mm -hmm. you know, and those are more sustainable in the long run. And so exercise and arthritis. So arthritis is one of the most common reasons people give for limiting physical activity. People with arthritis who are able to exercise regularly have less pain, more energy, improved sleep, and better function. Exercise improves strength and conditioning, reduces symptoms, improves functioning, and controls weight. It's a matter of doing it safely. So the four types of exercises I will go over. Flexibility, strengthening, aerobic conditioning, and body awareness, which I think we don't think about as much. So flexibility exercises improve range of motion and stretching, which helps maintain flexibility in the joints and surrounding muscles. It, improve, it improves posture and function and reduces injury. I, I put some suggestions there, and that's just kind of what I found as I was looking into all of this, but certainly I think everyone's situation is going to be different. Um, I often send my patients to physical therapists to help them determine what their baseline is, their, how they can improve and what exercises can be done safely within reason. Okay, but range of motion exercises such as neck stretches, shoulder swings, um, hip stretches, things like that, I would say five to ten times a day and uh, trying to do it about three times a week. Those with rheumatoid arthritis might find the stretching in the evening to help with the stiffness in the morning, which is a problem with rheumatoid arthritis, is people wake up and they're really stiff. And so doing the stretches at nighttime might help with that. Um, as I said, most of my patients I will send to a physical therapist to learn some of the stretching exercises, but other examples are yoga. It's a good way. Non-impact, nice stretching uh, routine. So strengthening exercises. Now this is designed to make the muscles work harder and makes the muscle stronger. By doing this, it provides greater joint support. And I was, someone had asked me about bursitis and other things earlier. 
And so the idea behind strengthening is if your joint is a little bit damaged with arthritis, it's, it's going to be weaker. And what it needs to do is recruit the muscles to do more work. And so the muscles need to be stronger to be able to do that. And what happens with pain and osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis is it's a vicious cycle of joint pain and then you do less and the muscles get weaker and then they can't do their job and then your joint hurts more and it's a cycle of that. So trying to get your muscles to do more for your joints is part of the strengthening exercises. So I think of one set of eight to 10 exercises for the major muscle groups. Once again, you know, two to three times a week if you can. I mean, in the end, anything you do is gonna be helpful. And so I don't like to, to have people feel guilty about missing things, and, and if you can just do it once a week, that's fine. But it, the, the idea is to, to not give up and to keep going. Examples of strengthening exercises are like lightweight and resistance. That can include um, light weights, like barbells, or you know, light weights, or rubber band resistance. Even exercise in water provides resistance. And I do like aquatic therapy for a lot of my patients just because the water makes you more buoyant. It uh, means that your joints are being less jarred. So walking in the water will give you the same benefits without that uh, pounding on the joints. So this is what we always think about with weight loss, aerobic exercises. Cardiovascular conditioning, which improves heart, lung, and muscle function. It benefits uh, for weight loss. And once again, this is just, you know, just a general goal. Try for 150 minutes, I say 120 to 150 minutes of moderate in intensity exercise a week. And moderate means that you can speak normally during the course of the sustained exercise. So I always think about, you know, grabbing a friend, you can walk around, say I live near Green Lake, you can walk around Green Lake, have a nice chat and catch up. And as long as you walk and you can speak comfortably, that counts. Spread it out. You can do this in five to 10 minute bouts and get 150 minutes in that way. You don't have to do it all at once. Examples of aerobic exercise include walking, dancing, a, a water aerobics, biking. So finally, body awareness exercises. This improves posture, balance, joint position, coordination, and relaxation. So when a joint and the surrounding muscle is affected by arthritis, it can often impair coordination and balance. So things like Tai Chi and yoga are good for that. So, ex you know, so an exercise program. Starting off slowly with a few low intensity exercises will help ensure a safe and successful exercise program. So this is a cartoon. You know, a gentleman is going out, he's walking his turtle. The doctor said, I need more exercise, but he wants me to start out easy. And that's exactly how you go about this. Um, I, I tell some of my patients, if you're not used to exercise, you know, go outside and walk to the mailbox and walk back. You know, walk halfway around the block and walk back. It takes time to build up and you will progress with time. But it, the idea is to go slowly so that you can sustain this and not injure yourself. So this is the Arthritis Foundation website. It's www.arthritis.org. And I, I bring this up because it's a nice resource. And it's a little bit small, but if you look right up here, it says My Community. And if you push on that, it'll give you some resources, programs and resources for better living. There, it'll give you some uh, exercise education, Tai Chi resources, aquatic programs, um, it's, a, it's a great resource if you're looking for ways to exercise safely with arthritis. Um, what you do when you go in here is you'll put in your zip code and it will pull up some local community centers um, that will do the various programs. So I think it's a good resource at least to start. Okay. So any questions on exercise? So we'll move on to food and inflammation. I will say I'm not a nutritionist. You guys have probably talked a lot more about nutrition and know a lot more about it than I do in some ways, but I'll bring up a few things. So the big question is always, you know, can certain foods reduce inflammation? And that is the million dollar question, does it? And I, I looked all over. I looked at Mayo Clinic. I looked at, you know, up to date. I looked at various 
you know, resources in trying to get this question answered. Uh, no conclusive evidence exists, although emerging research suggests some link between diet and inflammation. And even with, within that, there's a lot of debate, debate about specific foods and diets for, for arthritis specifically and inflammation. It does seem that some foods offer protection against inflammation, but clearly more research is needed. So what I'm going to talk about is, as I was looking at different types of diet and foods, there were common themes that came up. And so that's what I'm going to go over. So omega-3 fatty acids are thought to be anti-inflammatory. And those include fish sources such as salmon, tuna, trout, and herring. Vegetable sources include walnuts, peanut, or excuse me, pecans, and flaxseed. And while olive oil does not actually contain omega-3 fats, it does have some anti-inflammatory properties. The other one that came up is antioxidants. So oxidation is a natural process that leads to cell and tissue damage, thus associated with inflammation. Colorful vegetables and fruits, such as leafy greens, beets, and blueberries fall under this category. And spices, such as ginger and uh, turmeric, are also rich in antioxidants. So the villain in all of this that I found was omega-6 fatty acids. These are thought to boost inflammation. They're found in meat and vegetable oils. So it's thought that the greater ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 may increase inflammation. And you can lower this ratio by eating less fatty meats, less processed foods, which are very high in omega-6 oils, and more fruits, vegetables, and seafood. So this is another um, cartoon I found. You know, it's a gentleman who's visiting his doctor, and he's a little bit askew. And it says, you know, you need to go on a balanced diet. So that's the take home here, I think is I, it's hard to identify specific things, but the best approach is a well-balanced diet. A diet rich in fresh fruits and vegetables and lean, less fatty meats. We know this type of eating pattern has long been advocated for reducing risk of heart disease, diabetes, and high blood pressure already, and now it's thought to reduce overall inflammation and affect arthritis. I mean, I think as I was looking at various diets, you know, people talk about the Mediterranean diet, anti-inflammatory diet. I, I think there are subtle differences in all of these, but I think the take home is generally the same as a lot of fruits and vegetables, less processed foods. Um, and I think if you follow that, you will succeed in that way. So I'm gonna wrap up. So while there may not be a cure, there are effective management options for most types of arthritis. Pick some exercises that contribute to improve fitness and strength and something that you like, that you can sustain. I always tell people that, you know, it's hard to do something if you find it tedious and boring. And so if, if that's the case, find a different way to exercise. There's lots of fun ways. The other ways, you know, grab a friend and you can catch up during the week. You can hold each other accountable. Um, I regularly try to schedule my Saturday morning exercise routine with a friend and we have coffee afterwards and that's kind of our goal is to get to the end and have our coffee. So um, whatever it takes to keep you going in that way. Um, try to eat a balanced diet and I think it's, it's important to have a positive attitude. It, it's doable. It, it comes in small increments. There, there will be times where you are discouraged but in the end keep a positive attitude and it will get you somewhere. Um, finally, take control of the situation. You can make a difference between just coping with arthritis versus living well with arthritis. So we'll end up that. Thank you for listening. And once again, thank you for inviting me. Um, any questions or comments? So I'm kind of mulling over the nutritional stuff. Yeah. And um, in your research when you're, and certainly in the profession, have you come up on any really good data on the nightshade family? Because that seems to be bandied about a lot. And personally, I've also noticed that there's some, some validity to it. I'm just curious what the, what the data should suggest. Yeah, you know, I didn't find anything. Although I think when I talk to nutritionists who um, work with arthritis, they do mention the nightshades. And so I do make that recommendation. I couldn't find a lot of data, though. Um, and so we, I, I do. I mean, I think especially in the summer, it's hard. Tomatoes, 
and then people enjoy their potatoes and eggplants. But I think, you know, it's certainly worth, I always tell people it's always worthwhile to try. And if you notice a difference, then, then keep doing it. Yeah. Are there any medications that are new or on the horizon? For osteoarthritis? Yes, yeah, for osteoarthritis. You know, there isn't. I mean, oste I mean, that's that's really, I mean, the million dollar question in regards to food, it's also the million dollar question in regards to osteoarthritis. You know, at this point, we're not able to grow cartilage back to what it is supposed to be. I mean, there's a lot of uh, thoughts on visco supplementation, which you might have heard, which are like synvisc injections. Those are made out of rooster combs, and it's thought to help for some people, but at this point, I don't, I don't think there's anything close on the horizon. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Does having one kind of arthritis, is that a risk factor for additional kinds of arthritis? In other words, if you have osteo, are you more at risk for rheumatoid? Or? I mean, not necessarily. I think okay. the question, I mean, goes back to general inflammation, right? And, and are you... Does, does one source of inflammation potentially cause another source of inflammation? In general, we think that rheumatoid arthritis, we, we don't know why it happens. You know, like I said, there, there potentially is an estrogen effect because it does tend to affect women more in their reproductive years, so 20s to 40s, and that drops off, you know, after that. So there is a lot of research done on estrogens, um, but I don't necessarily think the two are, are clearly connected. Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, you know, we do know that when one joint is damaged, you will wear potentially that particular joint or even the other side. You know, if you've had a knee injury, you're going to wear those knees differently, and that's more going to be the problem as far as predisposing you. Any other questions? Yeah. What is the role of bursitis in, in yeah. osteoporosis? Well, so, so someone had asked me that question already. So bursitis is... Um, we say I, I guess I describe it as these uh, lubricating sacs that surround the joints and their function is to lubricate and protect and so when when those get inflamed you will get bursitis but it's not necessarily in your joint and usually it's surrounding the joint and so that's where you know when when people come to see me trying to sort out their source of pain is it coming from within the joint or is it in the surrounding soft tissues which would include muscle bursa, and tendons. Did that answer your question? Yeah. How, how, how would you approach? Oh, how would I approach that? Yeah. I mean, it's similar. I think, you know, some of the, the exercises that are protecting your joints, you're also conditioning the soft tissue. So I, I, I think I stress mostly muscles, but we're looking at the tendons and the bursa and trying to get the, the joint to function more normally despite being damaged. And so if you can strengthen the surrounding soft tissue, then you will be more likely not to have, let's say, bursitis or tendonitis. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, are bunions a normal outcome of osteoarthritis? So bunions are, so bunions are osteoarthritis typically in the great toe. And that is a manifestation of osteoarthritis. I mean, when we think about stress on joints, um, you know, that, that little toe joint actually carries a lot of weight. And so it is a very common place for osteoarthritis. Any other questions? Great. Well, thank you very much. Oh, oh yeah, go ahead. Is there a correlation between fibromyalgia and osteoarthritis? <laughs> That's a good question. It's a, it's a complicated question. So, you know, fibromyalgia is a pain syndrome. So technically it's not a disease because we, despite all this, the tests we can do, we can't necessarily find anything wrong. And so it's a little bit of a pain syndrome. How I see it connected with osteoarthritis or other arthritis conditions, we, we know one of the risk factors for fibromyalgia is deconditioning. So the muscles want to work. They want oxygen. But when you're inactive, it's not getting anything. And so, and then they start getting more stiff and they get achy. And so that's where I see fibromyalgia kind of connected with arthritis is more the lack of activity and the lack of strengthening, the lack of cardiovascular conditioning. And the muscles get grumpy and they want to do more and then they get more stiff. 
Does that make sense? I mean, it's a, it's a complicated question, but um, I think fibromyalgia is associated with a lot of conditions where people aren't as active as they used to be. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Food for thought. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, that was really nice. Um, I can say, and I, as a personal story, a lot of people know that I have rheumatoid arthritis. I've had it for 14 years and counting. And uh, there, there's so much out there that's on the horizon in research and development, those big drug companies. Um, it's an actually an exciting time to, to see, like, in the next five, 10 years, there's so many things that, you know, uh, not just biologics, but other, you know, gene therapies and things that could uh, give us hope for. Uh, certain types of arthritis, but uh, yeah, I liked your question about um, is there you know is there new drugs? And unfortunately, there's so many that we have, and it seems to be a lot of trial and error. Yeah. It'd be nice if we can yeah. actually tailor it to people a bit better. But uh, I think a lot of it comes back to what you're all doing already in this program, and kind of looking at your bigger health picture and getting more active and eating well and losing that five or ten pounds. So your knees get That'll fifty help. pounds less. Yeah. <laughs> well, have a great day, everybody. Thanks for coming, Thank and uh, see you next time. Yeah. Thanks. Bye.